What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to the remastered version of What If I Was Reborn As White Hunter Smoker? Path to True Justice, Part 6. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. With the call having abruptly ended, Kedu glared at the Den Den Mushi in front of him. Then, being the aggressive man that he was, he smashed the snail to its death, earning a flinch from his subordinates situated nearby. Together with the remnants of snail, the table and floor underneath were unable to handle Kedu's force. They powerlessly crumbled, and the entire building briefly shook from the stress. Gritting his teeth, Kedu stood up. In silence, he gulped down a bottle of sake before throwing the empty bottle away from him. His cheeks were blushed, and his form swayed, which indicated that he was completely drunk. No one could do anything but watch in fear as Kadu's form slowly morphed into a gigantic azure dragon, one that was magnificent and alluring. Smoker! The azure dragon then ascended to the sky. Roaring with a depth that reached the ears of every single alive being in Wano, the dragon was about to begin its flight at a rapid speed, until, Kadu. You must calm down, now isn't the time to be reckless. King, rushing onto the apex of Onigashima, brought Kadu back to his senses. What do you mean, King? White Hunter is an anomaly that needs attention, but is the matter involving him as urgent as this? In King's hands was the newspaper that was just released. With Kadu floating in the air as the gigantic Azure Dragon, King read what was written in the newspaper. Whitebeard Edward Newgate suffers defeat at the hands of Pirate Alliance led by strategist Achiku. Kadu's eyes became bloodshot, unable to believe what he just heard. What, what did you just say? The tide of the sea was changing. Without the presence of the strongest man in the world, the new world has lost its rightful owner. On top of the upcoming war between the world government and the revolutionary army, the sea has become even more chaotic, Kadu san and Kadu, shocked to the core, fell from the sky to the ground. With the gigantic azure dragon crashing against numerous buildings of Onigashima, the island was immediately reduced to ruins. Some inhabitants were crushed underneath him. However, Kadu didn't seem to care. He, while looking up at the sunny sky, muttered to himself, Whitebeard, No, Newgate, you're joking with me, right? Kadu was someone who thought that the reason why people strive to improve is to achieve the most epic death one can ever imagine. And Whitebeard, the man whom Kadu acknowledged to be stronger than him, he died what Kadu considered to be an abrupt and pathetic death. For someone like Whitebeard to meet an end like this, brought rage in Kadu's heart. At the same time, Kadu felt a subtle fear, that he too might face a death as worthless as that. Boom! Shrinking back into his human form, Kadu slammed his fist on the hard ground. Standing back up, Kadu looked at King who flew down and landed in front of him. King. With a deep frown, Kadu ordered, prepare for a sail. King, thinking that Kadu still wasn't at his senses, tried to refute, Kadu san What, it is because of that news that we must hurry? King became silent. If Pirate Alliance can take Whitebeard down, then who knows what that White Hunter might be able to do. The area around Wayno was Kadu's turf. At the moment, Kadu held the advantage, and this meant that if more time were to be given, Smoker would be the one to gain more benefits than Kadu. Turning around, Kadu gazed at the vast ocean ahead of him. Instead of waiting for his arrival, we'll strike him first. Dress Rosa, Prudence. Meliana. Vast Road. These are the three kingdoms that are located in the east of Dressrosa. Those kingdoms, protected by Dressrosa and Calm Belt, have gotten accustomed to peace over numerous years. Their defenses were in a deficiency, and they were incompetent to fend off the invasion of beast pirates. Smoker and Maynard listened as King Elizabello II of Prudence explained. Even now, they are still occupied by beast pirates. Having learned that they lost control over Dressrosa, a huge number of pirates will be sent over. And knowing Kadu's nature, 
there also exists a chance for him to personally come here. Currently, everyone was sitting around a couple of bonfires that were set to warm themselves up, with the remainder of beast pirates taken care of. In their hands were foods which they vigorously ate away, and it's been a while since they've got to fill their stomachs to the brim. To get to rest in comfort without having to work endlessly, people couldn't believe that this truly was the reality. In a single day, everything changed. So, in short, Dress Rosa will be surrounded. Smoker stood up, earning everyone's attention. Gazing at Elizabello Tu's arms that had no hands grimly, Smoker eventually stated, then, preparations must be done. Like, building a wall? Maynard scratched his head as he spoke. For some reason, the current situation reminded Smoker of the buster call that he encountered in O'Hara. Back then, he tried to save everyone against the approaching cannonballs of Marines, but his lack of strength prevented him from achieving his goal. Kadu of the Beast? The sheer number of people who suffered because of this man was immeasurable. A catastrophe indeed, Smoker couldn't help but think as he gazed at the sky. The situation was complex yet simple. Pirates were preparing to reach for one piece, and due to these preparations, people were suffering. If so, erasing those pirates off of this world, would solve all problems, wouldn't it? I'll be leaving Wayno to you folks. Lowering his gaze, Smoker looked around him. Everyone was looking back at him expectantly, with hope glimmering in their eyes. Smoker cracked a smile as he lifted his hand and then, clenched it into a fist. The portion of ground which everyone lied above began to quake. Wondering what was going on, people yelped as they took cover or stared at Smoker wide-eyed. Oi, Smoker! Maynard shouted in confusion, what are you about to do? Maynard was left speechless, and so were the others. Cracks formed on the ground, before the portion of ground which they stood on top of began to levitate up. Below said platform, there was a large mass of white cloud that relentlessly pushed it up to the sky. The plan is simple. People watched in awe as they found themselves standing on top of a flying mini-island. Let them waste their time in Dress Rosa. Meanwhile, Smoker's eyes gleamed as he gazed at the eternal poses that were laid nearby the campfire, Prudence, Meliana, and Vast Road. We'll be wreaking havoc in there. A week after, within the calm sea near Dress Rosa, where nothing but a vast horizon could be seen, countless black dots appeared from afar. Those were ships, which approached Dress Rosa with malicious intentions. Beast pirates. This wasn't even the full might of their capability, and yet, it was far more than enough to surround a large island. On the flagship, there stood Kadu, who grimly stared at the island ahead. Right in front of him, there were four Den Den Mushies. Among four, only one seemed to be active. It was the voice of Queen, the number three of the crew. Kadu stayed silent, and King by the side was the one who ended the call. Kadu, the other three aren't responding. Prudence, Miliana, and Vastrode, they are the islands where Sheep's Head, Jinrami, and Babanuki are in charge of. Shinuchis, you mean. Within the Beast Pirates, there was a ranking system that was classified purely based on one's strength. Following the model of the wilderness, it was the stronger ones who were given the greater authority. At the bottom of the ladder, there were thousands of goons. Above them, there were Shinuchis, those who were given the right to lead goons. Above Shinuchis, there were six Toborapas. Starting from this ranking, the members are considered the executives of the Beast Pirates. Hibiki the Carnivore was one of them. Above Toborapas, there were three All-Stars, King the Conflagration, Queen the Plague, and Jack the Famine. These three members were well-known individuals who were considered the might of Beast Pirates. Finally, there was Kadu, the Governor General of the Beast Pirates. Kadu san Then, Kadu and King shifted their attention to a goon of Beast Pirates who hurriedly ran up to them. This goon, for some reason, seemed to have disbelief written in his eyes as he gulped in front of Kadu. In his hands was a pair of binoculars, and Kadu didn't have a good feeling about what was going to be spoken out of said goon's mouth. D. Dress Rosa. Dress Rosa what? Impatiently, Kadu growled. Dress Rosa, the kingdom is empty. There? There is no sign of white hunter or civilians, none at all. Ha! Huh. King frowned as he looked at the trembling goon, refusing to believe what he heard. Kadu stayed silent for a moment. Then, he wordlessly snatched the pair of binoculars from the goon's hand and placed it in front of his eyes. Nothing. 
There was nothing but the corpses of beast pirates, decomposing with nothing but silence around them. The entirety of Dressrosa was devoid of life. How? There was an outburst. Kadu roared as he crushed the binoculars in his grip. How the fuck did they leave within a week? The beast pirates learned that they were surrounding nothing but the corpses of their crew members. And then, Kadu flinched before his eyes widened. Having received a premonition, he hurriedly looked up at the sky. Just a few seconds ago, it was a clear, sunny day. Now, there was a huge mass of dark clouds that swirled in an abnormal manner right above them. It didn't take much for Kadu to realize what was about to happen. White Hunter! Just when Kadu roared, arcane judgment. Countless rays of lightning descended from the sky, blasting away the ships belonging to beast pirates. So this is Wayno? Damn, rahahaha. Hina tired. In the middle of the harsh sea, one ship was found swaying along the violent waves. Standing on top of its deck were Aramaki, Bastille, Hina, Rosinanti, Robin, Senor Pink, and X Drake. They, while wearing raincoats to help themselves with the rain, looked at the huge waterfall that was falling from the land above, which was covered by fog. So, Rosinanti asked reluctantly, how do we get up there? Climb? Climb? Hina amused. Hina snickered at that, Smoker's the only one who'd be willing to do that. Bastille laughed, Dara Dara, true. Well, carrying the conversation, Aramaki began to operate his devil fruit ability, we can do this. At the next moment, numerous roots suddenly sprouted from Aramaki's body. They, covering up the ship, had their other end sticking onto the rocky cliff of Wayno. After, upon Aramaki's control, they began to ascend the cliff vertically. Onto Wayno where Kadu was no longer present, the group began the infiltration. Don, I'm calling from Big Mom's territory. I have White Den Den Mushy with me, so worry not for a potential of eavesdropping. Looking around his left and right, one man whispered into a mini Den Den Mushy in his hands. Big Mom has gotten her hands on a person from the Three Eye Tribe. Recently, that man has awakened his ability to decipher poneglyphs. On the other side of the call, Achiku smiled as he tapped his fingers on a table. Perfect. After their victory against Whitebeard Pirates, they were closer to One Piece than they ever have been. However, one thing has kept them troubled, the lack of a way to read and decipher poneglyphs, that is. That was primarily the reason why Achiku closely monitored Dr. Vegapunk, there was no way that the world's most intelligent and curious man would ignore the enigma known as poneglyphs. Unfortunately, Dr. Vegapunk, during their war against Whitebeard pirates, abruptly disappeared. Achiku was investigating the cause, however, with the information regarding Big Mom having been given to him, Dr. Vegapunk was no longer needed. You heard that. Behind Achiku was Blackbeard Marshal D. Teach, who stood up from his seat full of beautiful women. He grinned with a strong ambition visible in his eyes. Zihahaha. The next destination of Pirate Alliance, whose leader was outwardly known as Strategist Achiku, was set. With our plans having been successfully integrated, the world government is now in a pinch. Monkey D, Dragon and his revolutionary army. Currently, they were in a war room, along with the past marines ranging from Garp to Zephyr. Mariehua is running out of food supplies. Though we can't see what exactly is happening within, they will eventually be forced to descend themselves to meet their needs. In the middle of the room, there was one large map, it was an incomplete map that depicted Mariehua, the red line below, and islands surrounding the red line. On top of the two among the surrounding islands, pieces were laid. Right now, East Army under the command of Jinni and West Army under the command of Morley are deployed into Jin Kingdom and Shishano Kingdom, respectively. If their missions are to go in success, we will now have complete control over 12 kingdoms that are located in proximity to Mariehua, giving us full control. This way, the Den Den Mushi cried. Within the silence, the cry echoed throughout the room. For some reason, it gave a chill in everyone's spine. Kuma, who was observing the Den Den Mushi with weary eyes, found himself shedding a cold sweat. Knowing that a call at this time signaled a dire situation, Dragon immediately accepted the call. There were noises, the noises of explosions, gunfires, civilians crying, and more. The man who called seemed to be injured, as there was no power behind his speech and he had to pause in the middle to take a breathing. 
Yes, this is Supreme Commander Monkey D. Dragon. Speak. Kuma, unable to hold in, shouted in urgency, Jijini. Is she alright? That's all that Kuma needed to hear. Immediately after, Kuma hurriedly ran out of the room, and through the operation of his devil fruit, shot himself through the sky, toward the Tajin kingdom where the East Army was deployed. Dragon, with a grimace, thought briefly. He then spoke, the war has already begun. This isn't a mere retaliation. The fact that God's knights are present in Tajin, means that they've opened an all-out war. Tsuru seemed to be agreeing with Dragon, and losing the East Army would be critical in terms of not only the military strength of our force but also our morale. Though that Kuma's action was born out of rashness, this ongoing battle in Tajin must be intervened. Heh. Everything was finally going down to one simple truth, war. Garp, bumping his fists together, liked the simplicity of the situation. Our younger generation is currently dealing with problems in the new world. Zephyr grinned as he clenched his right fist in vigor, we can't have them surpass us just yet, can we? From the map, Dragon lifted a piece that was laid on top of a white cloud that was drawn atop comm belt. Then, he slammed it down on the Tajin kingdom, where another piece was already sitting. There won't be any tricks. Let us go, to the war that will decide the fate of this world. Revolutionary Army vs. World Government The turmoil that everyone in the world has been watching in nervousness, finally broke into a full-scale war. Most of the beast pirates on the ship were reduced into piles of ashes immediately. It was only a select few who barely managed to survive, albeit with severe injuries. Ugh. Huff, huff. What, just, happened? Kadu, surrounded by the damaged ships that were smoking as they sank, glared murderously at Smoker who hovered high above in the sky. His right hand slowly reached for his priced weapon, Hasaikai, which was a massive kanabo with sharp spikes on its surface. King. King, who seemed to have calmed down, heard Kadu's order. Wayno. What flashed in Kadu's mind wasn't the ongoing situation in Prodence, Meliana, or Vast Road. No, those kingdoms were none of his interest. Go back to Wayno and ensure that no bug has gotten through. If Smoker was able to magically make the citizens of Dressrosa disappear, who knew what else he could do? Furthermore, how could Kadu trust that what he witnessed was the truth, that those three kingdoms were taken over? Within Kadu was a sprout of paranoia, born from the death of Whitebeard. To seize one piece. To become the beginning of the end, the beginning of the war that will bring this world to its true state. Kadu was waiting long for this moment to come. Though he desired to face the death of a warrior, he didn't wish to give up the chance to become the pirate king. In that sense, he couldn't afford to lose Wayno, the base of his fleet. As long as Wayno belonged to him, he could always restore his force. And Kadu, just from this encounter, knew that Smoker was a sneaky fellow. You hear that, King? Yes. King, after glancing at Smoker coldly, turned around and transformed into a large pteranodon. Opening his wings, he soared up at high speed. However, before he left, he suddenly turned to Smoker, and, Imperial slings and arrows, sent forth a series of sharp air projectiles at Smoker, which flew dangerously at him. Smoker, sensing no integration of hockey within the technique, raised an eyebrow as his body partially morphed into smoke and let said air projectiles bypass him with ease. King! As Kadu roared, King clicked his tongue before flying away. Smoker, watching as King flew, raised his finger, aiming at King's back. White, however, Smoker was then forced to utilize Jeppo to shift backward, dodging an arc of sharp air projectile that was several times more lethal than King's. Quickly looking down, he saw that Kadu was flying at him in his human form, holding onto his Hasaikai with both hands. Thunder! Kadu growled as his Hasaikai revealed a black spark that crackled dangerously. Infusion of Conqueror's Hockey, ha! Huh? Smoker revealed a serious expression, knowing that this wasn't going to be an easy fight. Conqueror's Hockey, Infusion. It is not only the hardest but also the strongest technique one may be able to muster with Hockey. You hear that, brat? He recalled the words he heard from his one and only teacher, Garp. By concept alone, it is similar to armament hockey. You wrap around yourself or your weapon but with conqueror's hockey instead of armament hockey. What makes this especially difficult is the fundamental difference between those two types of hockeys. 
Armament hockey is born from a will to defend, a will to capture the true state of enemies. Being a will born to reinforce one physically, it was meant to be draped from the very start. In contrast, conqueror's hockey is conceptually far more abstract. Conqueror's hockey, a will to conquer, is essentially the manifestation of your ambition itself. Unlike armament hockey, the level at which this hockey afflicts damage onto the enemies transcends beyond the level of physical injuries. Technically, it can be considered that Conqueror's Hockey crushes enemies' very ambition itself. Infusion of Conqueror's Hockey, therefore, serves two purposes. One, by wrapping yourself around with it, you protect yourself from enemies' ambitions. Two, by concentrating your will into a singular region through infusion, the effect of Conqueror's Hockey becomes amplified by a vast extent. White, upon smoker's will, a mass of white smoke swirled before condensing into a white smoke made bat. As he caught it with his right hand, said bat was imbued by armament hockey, emission. Then, the bat began to descend at Kadu, who swung his hasaikai upward. Just before the, the clash occurred, Kadu then saw, a burst of black spark. Bagua, forward slash, crash. An incredible force arose without two weapons coming into direct contact. As the struggle began between them, the black sparks flew everywhere and the very air itself trembled from the might of the clash. And then, the sky itself has been split into two. One barely conscious member of Beast Pirates, from below, stared at the scene in a mix of fear and disbelief with his eyes squinted to minimize the impact of the strong gust. He the sky. And that's all he managed to say before the strong wave consumed the entire ship and sent it into the depths of the water. The air itself pulsated and screeched as the clash seemed to have no end. Kadu, glaring at Smoker, growled, Infusion, how is it that you are able to do it, White Hunter? Only a handful of people in this world are born with Conqueror's Hockey. Awakening Conqueror's Hockey was one thing, and refining it into Conqueror's Hockey, Infusion, the possession of this skill itself was proof that its user stood at the apex of the world. Rox D. Zebeck, G.O.L.D. Roger, Edward Newgate, Charlotte Lin Lin, Monkey D. Garb, and Kadu himself. So you're telling me, that you stand on the same level as us? Feeling a tinge of excitement within the vigorous rage, Kadu retracted Hasaikai and morphed his entire body into a gigantic azure dragon, within a split second. Right in front of Smoker, Kadu's large mouth was opened, revealing sharp teeth. Blast breath. A concentrated blast of fire was breathed out from Kadu's agape mouth, right onto Smoker. The blast of fire traveled a vast distance before it hit a body of water, generating a huge amount of steam. Wurororo. Kadu shifted his eyes at his back, knowing that Smoker wasn't hit by it. White Storm. And then Kadu saw, Smoker standing right behind him with a huge volume of white smoke swirling around atop his palm. A hurricane made out of white smoke was then drilled onto Kadu's draconic body, Pesado. Boom! The air exploded from the sudden impact, and Kadu's huge body was blasted back. However, Kadu simply let out a small grunt as he forced his body to stop the flight. Turning his head, Kadu's gigantic eyes met Smoker's. Smoker found himself grinning, and so did Kadu. Within a day, nature witnessed the burst of black sparks countless times. The sea below wildly churned. The sky above revealed nothing but a clear blue, with clouds having completely been demolished from the impact alone. The buildings and constructs on Dressrosa crumbled down, unable to withstand the incoming force. The black spark rose as Kadu's Kanabo, Hasaikai, and Smoker's smoke made white bat clashed yet again. It was unknown for how long they had been fighting, but one thing was for sure, none of the two were yet exhausted or injured. Wurororo. Kadu spun Kanabo in his grip as he landed on Dressrosa with his feet. Laughing boisterously, his eyes were swirling in a thick lust for blood. Then, Smoker dropped directly onto Kadu, and the flash of black spark arose once more. Dressrosa's earth quaked. The remnants of fallen buildings bounced, cracked, and were reduced to dust as the strong wind blew off from the center of the island. And finally, the clash ended with Smoker and Kadu getting knocked back from one another's strike. As they stood far away from each other, Kadu tightened his grip over Kanabo in excitement. It doesn't take long for me to know, that you are a warrior like I am, White Hunter. Though you try not to admit it, in your heart, fighting is what makes you more excited than anything else, just like me. Smoker, 
who stood too far away from Kadu to listen to what the latter was saying, readied himself for his next attack. There is no guarantee that beast pirates will stay still as I continue fighting Kadu. The kingdoms of Prodence, Meliana, and Vastrode may experience a second invasion. Though Maynard is in Meliana, the safety of the other two kingdoms cannot be guaranteed. Time isn't on my side. Seeing Smoker's movement, Kadu too lowered his form, about to blast himself from the ground he was standing on top of. Fear. Fear of dying a worthless death haunted my mind. However, standing in front of you. Kadu grinned as he blasted himself toward Smoker, I came to think, of how trivial those thoughts were. Smoker and Kadu's eyes read the future. Their observation hockey was on par, and they knew that an attempt to evade each other's attack through the use of observation hockey wouldn't work. Kadu, as he towered over Smoker with his gigantic height, swung his kanabo downward. The weapons clashed, which generated a flash of black lightning. Kundali. The clash was just the beginning. Kadu's kanabo moved at an incredible speed, bombarding Smoker with Conqueror's Haki-infused strikes from all directions. Dragon Swarm. The surroundings seemed to slow down in Smoker's view as countless strikes came flying in from all sides. In this state, Smoker's entire body was wrapped around by his armament hockey. Blackout. Then occurred, the sudden swarm of black smoke with Smoker in the center. Kadu was momentarily caught off guard by the abrupt darkness before the entirety of the black smoke was set on fire and exploded magnificently, which effectively repelled Kadu's attacks away from Smoker. Kadu, whose entire body was now encased in armament hockey, grinned as he twisted his body to swing Kanabo at his back. Along with the explosive noise, Smoker's fist and Kadu's Kanabo found themselves in a power struggle, though they weren't in direct contact. Once more, the black sparks zapped throughout the area. From the sheer force alone, the entire body of smoke that surrounded them swirled wildly. Somehow, Kadu seemed to be capable of neglecting the smoke that surrounded him. The scarce air that remained was enough for him to function, he truly was the strongest creature in the world. As the clash came to an end, Kadu's body instantly morphed into a gigantic azure dragon and soared out of the smoke. Let's see if you can handle this. Under Smoker's watch, Kadu in his dragon form spun rapidly. Dragon Twister. The wind began to pick up, and eventually, several tornadoes were generated at Dressrosa, destroying whatever it lied in their paths. In response, the mass of smoke transformed into similar-sized tornadoes of smoke that swirled around Smoker. Black Storm. Then, said smoke tornadoes simultaneously caught on fire. In their blazing state, they directly clashed against Kadu's tornadoes and exploded altogether. During this occasion, Kadu was flying at a sky high above Smoker. His mouth opened, and a scorching hot fire began to concentrate in front of it. Blast Breath. Smoker already had a swirling ball of white smoke prepared on his hand. He, in response to the incoming blast of fire, proceeded to throw the ball. White Blast. The blast of fire met the blast of smoke in the middle. This smoke, possessing the characteristic that was closer to steam than smoke, didn't combust into the fire, but rather, combated the fire as if it was the fire extinguishing agent. The specks of fire and smoke splattered everywhere as the collision continued. The sky was filled with red and gray, which showcased an unreal view that was sufficient enough to be called a calamity. From the mix of fire and smoke, Smoker captured Kadu's silhouette as both his white blast and Kadu's blast breath came to an end. Then, said silhouette began to get larger and larger, which indicated that Kadu was descending right on where Smoker stood, before the silhouette abruptly disappeared. Conqueror of three worlds, from the smoke, Kadu, whose human-like body was now covered in the blue scales of the Azure Dragon, laughed as he slammed his kanabo straight on where Smoker stood. Say me kikan, stay ample. Smoker's body began to release white steam as he breathed in and out. The physical capability of his body increased by several folds, and the muscles on his body seemed to have inflated slightly. Locking his eyes onto Kadu, Smoker raised his right hand and clenched it into a fist. White, all smoke in the surroundings, within a split second, swirled into his fist. This happened way too quick, such that it appeared as if the space itself was being distorted around his fist. His fist itself glowed in bright light as the incredibly dense smoke from within collided and generated an incomprehensible amount of energy. 
In that state, Smoker jumped up and met Kadu's Kanabo with his fist. Ragnaraku, forward slash, galaxy. There was an explosion unlike any other. Huge enough to consume half of Dressrosa, the clash between two unfathomable strikes generated destruction that not only ground the land into a plane but also generated a huge recoil that caused two conquerors to be blasted away in the opposite direction. A dome of bright explosions consumed the island. Then, there was rumbling, followed by giant waves of the sea that rippled out centering Dressrosa. As for Smoker, he found his body being flown out of Dressrosa before he could control himself. By the time he registered, he found his body embedded deep in the ground. Spitting blood out of his mouth, Smoker stood up without an ounce of pain and jumped his way out of the crater he generated. Where am I? Smoker, looking around his surroundings plainly, blinked his eyes. How the fuck, without concluding the fight against Kadu, Smoker found himself flown all the way to, a mysterious island he'd never come across. Simply put, he was lost. Smoker wasn't the only one who was lost in the middle of nowhere. White Hunter. Show yourself. Kadu, flying in the middle of the sky where nothing but a vast sea was seen, screamed Smoker's title over and over. Zebek. Standing outside the flagship of Blackbeard Pirates, Achiku spoke. So far, everything has gone smoothly. Starting from your acting as Marshal D. Teach, joining Whitebeard Pirates, attaining Dark Dark Fruit, and finding us once more to restore the Rock's Pirates. Newgate has been defeated, and now, it's Lin Lin. If we were to gain control of the Three-Eye Tribe member, as well as gain the final Road Ponglyph, we truly would be ready to sail for One Piece. Behind Achiku was Blackbeard who drank endlessly as he looked at the setting sun. I wanted to ask, was everything planned from the very start? Plan everything? Zihahaha, you speak as if I'm a god, Achiku. Are you not? Blackbeard grinned. Not yet. Lifting his mug filled with alcohol, Blackbeard completely emptied it. Why do you believe I let Newgate and Linlin -Lin in my crew, Achiku, when I knew that their loyalties don't belong to me? I simply thought that you recruited them because of their strength. Zihahaha. If that was all they had to offer, I would have fought them instead. Rather, the true reason why I had them in my crew, was to have them under my grasp at all times. It was because, their devil fruits, tremor tremor fruit and soul soul fruit, were far too valuable. Achiku's eyes sharpened as he understood Blackbeard's intention. Then, our travel to Tataland is. Not only to snatch that three-eyed man from Lin Lin, but also. Achiku felt himself grinning madly in anticipation. This was, and is Rock's D. Zebek, the one and only captain whom he would serve. Zebek, the man full of ambition, the man who will lead them into the new world, the world that all pirates have been dreaming of. The sun disappeared behind the horizon, and the sky has darkened substantially. Blackbeard's eyes seemed to glow in crimson as his grin became wilder. Those who carry D in their name don't understand the true meaning of it. Dawn? Destiny? Devil? Those words aren't enough to convey the symbolism behind D. No, D is the symbol of our dream, the idea that the ancient kingdom of the past sought to achieve. The absolute freedom that is, Zihahaha. The freedom that was to be bestowed unto the entire world, for the sake of one man's ambition, the king of the ancient kingdom, Rox D. Zax. Achiku found his hands shaking in excitement. Gulping, he asked one final question. Then, just what is one piece? Just what is it that you require it for the achievement of your dream? One Piece, eh. Blackbeard, no, Rox D. Zebek, chuckled as he stared at his palm. Wealth, fame, and power, all will be attained if you were to find One Piece, the treasure that no one knows if it exists even, with the exclusion of the remaining members of Roger Pirates, and me, that is. Zebek clenched his hand tight as if trying to snatch something greedily. There is a saying that was passed down within those who carry the surname of Rox. One piece, it is the key. The final piece that is required to activate Joyboy's plan that was placed to a halt because of one mistake by an idiotic elephant. That elephant's mission was simple, to deliver one of the three ancient weapons, Uranus, to the kingdom of Blackfeathered Tribe. However, the elephants forgotten that their old land was taken over by twenty opposing kingdoms, and ended up giving Uranus to the enemies. This, was the reason why Joyboy's plan was unable to proceed. Zebek reopened his palm. Letting his arm drop by the side, he saw that a moon was now rising. 
Thus, one piece is something, something that activates the ancient weapons. The ancient weapons, with the exclusion of Poseidon, are the machine constructs that have high demands for energy to function. Then, isn't the answer simple? Zebek's eyes gleamed in certitude. One piece is a source of energy. Once upon a long time, there was a boy named Toby. Sitting in front of Luffy, Ace, Baby Five, Monet, Sugar, and many other children was Kujaku, who was reading them a children's tale. Born a slave, he was to serve his master forevermore. Slave? Luffy tilted his head. What is that? A food? Idiot! Ace bumped Luffy on the head, causing Luffy to cry in pain as he rolled on the ground. Slave is a person who is forced to work for a master. What? That sucks. Chuckling at Luffy's antics, Kujaku continued reading. Toby's master was a bad person. He gave Toby only a small amount of food and expected Toby to work every day without any rest. Kujaku flipped to the next page. Toby wished for a freedom. He wanted to break free from his master. He wanted to escape and travel around the world. Then came, the warrior of freedom. Kujaku was about to flip to the next page, but paused as she saw Monet covering up Sugar's ears. What are you doing, Monet? Monet looked at Kujaku in suspicion. I'm not going to let you corrupt Sugar. What do you mean by that? We're not going to be swayed by your slithery words, cultist. Eh? Baby Five turned to Kujaku in bewilderment. So that's what you were up to? Kujaku couldn't help but sweat drop. Is this true? In front of Big Mom, Charlotte Lin Lin, sheets of paper were found. On top of them, the translation of Ponglyphs were scribbled, and these were the works of Charlotte Cottage, the three-eyed man who was currently Big Mom's husband. Joy Boy's decision to become a pirate arose from his disagreement with the ideal of the ancient kingdom. As the tension between the ancient kingdom and twenty allied kingdoms escalated, Joy Boy traveled across the world to seek those who were willing to teach the world true freedom. I, I'm not sure if it's true or not. But that's what I read off of them. Lin Lin humped as she moved on to another sheet of paper, ignoring the cry of cottage. The war began with the invasion of the Lunarian Kingdom by 20 allied kingdoms. Lunarian Kingdom, located atop the Red Line, was in proximity to the Ancient Kingdom. The takedown of Lunarians served as a blatant taunt for the Ancient Kingdom. Hmm. Humming in thought, Lin Lin continued reading, before her eyes widened in realization. And so, the Ancient Kingdom directly clashed with 20 allied kingdoms. Though they paled in number, they had vastly superior technology that granted them the upper hand. Said technology, having mimicked the four god fruits, was termed as devil fruits. Are you drunk again, Rayleigh? In Sabaeti Archipelago, there was a wooden building named Shaki's Ripoff Bar. Inside the building, a white-haired man was mumbling his words as he drank heartily. Though a woman of short black hair behind the counterside, the man didn't seem to mind. The war seemed to be going in the ancient kingdom's favor, until the twenty allied kingdoms whipped out Uranus out of nowhere. Though many were sacrificed to operate it once, it was enough for twenty allied kingdoms to change the tide of the war. The white-haired man, Silver's Rayleigh, chuckled. Imagine my surprise, Shaki, when we came across those Ponglyphs. Apparently, in the past, the world was connected. Instead of islands, there were continents. Though the red line stood tall, there were open passages down below that allowed people to move past it with ease. And? The existence of Uranus. The way in which twenty allied kingdoms changed the tide of the battle. The ancient kingdom being filled with devil fruit users. Today's world where sea consumes the majority of the world. The ruins and evidence of civilizations found deep in the sea. Everything clicked, and we concluded in the end, that the sea level rose abnormally. And if our speculation is correct, this was done by Uranus. Rayleigh shook his head. Thankfully, the use of ancient weapons requires a vast amount of energy. Though I am not sure how twenty allied kingdoms of the past managed to gather the energy, one thing is for sure, they aren't able to operate it as many times as they want. At last, Rayleigh seemed to have gotten Shaki interested in the topic. Leaning herself forward and placing her elbow atop the bar table, she asked. Then, just who made those ancient weapons? And why? Rayleigh grinned. Joy Boy. Joy Boy? The man who is known as the first pirate, and, the wielder of a fruit that gave him the rubber-like properties. 
Rayleigh lifted the glass of alcohol and watched as the liquid inside swirled. He found many allies along his journey. They together made two constructs with the dream of freeing this world from what he considered dangerous ideals. Rayleigh brought the glass to his lips and gulped down the liquid. Revealing satisfaction, he wiped his mouth and chuckled. Pluton, the battleship that is capable of destroying whole islands in a single shot. Uranus, the flying construct that gathers up the moisture in the outside world and pours it down. They planned on destroying the ancient kingdom, then red line, with Pluton. Then, Uranus would pour and submerge this world, drowning everyone who was exposed to it. Shaki looked at Rayleigh in disbelief. Joy boy? Really? Ha ha ha. That too was my honest reaction. A plan so ridiculous and dangerous that we couldn't help but think that he was nothing but a psychopath, we couldn't help but laugh at that. But listen, that's not the end of the story. How many ancient weapons are known today? 3. Pluton. Huh? I see. Rayleigh nodded while enjoying Shaki's reaction. Poseidon. It was the title given to the mermaid princess of Merfolks. She, being capable of communicating with sea kings, was given the task of ordering them to pull Noah, the ship of promise, to prevent innocent civilians from facing calamity. Everything seemed to be going well, until... Zunesha, he ended up delivering Uranus at the hands of twenty allied kingdoms instead. Rayleigh placed the empty glass on the table and stared at it. All plans had to be stopped. Joy Boy sent apology letters, saying that the plan couldn't proceed. He began to set up another plan, one that ensured that a future person who dreams of true freedom like he does will be able to pick up this plan. Anne? What comes after, sir? Sitting on top of a giant whale that cried happily, two people, or one person and one skeleton could be seen. The person's name was Crocus, who used to be a doctor who boarded Oro Jackson, G.O.L.D. Rogers' ship. The skeleton, on the other hand, was Brooke, the man who transcended death by eating the Revive Revive fruit. He was lost and trapped in Florian Triangle for a long time, but managed to find a way out after his persistent effort, and got to reunite with Laboon the Whale, his old friend. Currently, Brooke was found asking Crocus in anticipation. The plan was simple. In the past, and the present still, there exists no way to operate Pluton and Uranus. Perhaps the world government can utilize Uranus once if they manage to find a way to accumulate the energy for the past 800 years, but even such is not enough to meet the energy demand. Well, except for Joy Boy, I'd say. What about Joy Boy then? What made him so special? Human Human Fruit, Model, Nika. Being one of the four god fruits, one who managed to consume and awaken the true power of this fruit was said to gain, an endless bound of energy, truly befitting the title of the sun god. Brook exhibited shock, with his open so wide that his bones seemed as if they were going to fall apart. Then, one piece is? Yes. Crocus nodded grimly. One piece is? Lin Lin, Rayleigh, and Crocus, in different places and times, stated. Joy Boy's heart. Ba bump. On the island shrouded by the mist, there sits a heart, encased by a transparent cube. For some reason, even though its owner was long dead, the heart continued beating without knowing its end, as if waiting for a new owner to arrive. Within the silent garden, the sensation of peace and oppression coexisted, all because of one individual's presence. We were different yet similar, rocks D. Zax. Reaching out his hand to let a butterfly sit on it, this enigmatic individual shrouded by veil, Nerona Emu, murmured. What both of us desired, in the end, was to exist as the sole ruler of the throne. It was the methodology of achieving such that made us different. Through his shadowy figure, his red eyes swirled. Then, surprisingly, the butterfly on his hand began to move bizarrely, as if it was being controlled by him. Whether to achieve absolute control over the entire world and monitor every corner of it, or to present destruction to everyone but oneself. Nevertheless, the ultimate goal was to ensure that the ruler's power would remain absolute for eternity. The butterfly flew up, albeit wobbly. However, joy boy. If not for Zunesha's error, we would have never found out about his scheme. And if I were to think that Lily may have sided with him. Emu's eyes gleamed coldly, and the traveling butterfly then exploded into pieces. No, I must be overthinking. Yes. Lily, she was one of the twenty. There is no way that Lily would betray Mu. Turning around, 
He whispered, right, Lily? In the middle of the garden, there was a figure of a woman, one that was covered by flowers from head to toe. Big news. Kuahahaha. In the middle of the office full of journalists where they busily wrote down the information that was relayed through Den Den Mushies, a bird human shouted in joy. This bird human was Big News Morgans, the president of the World Economy newspaper. Now this is getting exciting. It took a little for the president of the world's biggest newspaper company to know that all these events, which were happening simultaneously, weren't by chance. They were a sign that a huge war was about to break out. Shelley. Morgans immediately reached one journalist and tapped her on the back. Pay close attention to the situation in the Tajin Kingdom, all right? My hunch tells me that something big, something we've never come across, is about to happen. Kuahahaha. Fucking president, why are you laughing when the world's in a state like this? Grumbling, the journalist named Shelley immediately got to work, complying with Morgans's order. In Marine Ford, on the highest floor of the headquarters, there lied the fleet admiral's office. Within the room, Sakazuki was found smoking a cigar as he silently heard the order that came from the Den Den Mushi ahead of him. Sakazuki, why did he become a fleet admiral in the first place? To purge all evils. To eradicate pirates. To prevent the same tragedies. In Sakazuki's mind lingered an event from the past, when his hometown was invaded and destroyed by pirates from happening again. However, Sakazuki was now tired. It felt as if all the efforts that he put in had gone to waste, as they bore no fruit. The world continued to get worse and worse, and the feeling of helplessness crept into him. Sakazuki, seeing that there was no response from Sakazuki, one of the five elders from the other side of Den Den Mushi spoke in a low tone. That's when Sakazuki's eyes trembled. He found himself drenched in a cold sweat as he finally realized why his efforts bore no fruit. His thorough justice, it has long been fallen. All that was left in him now, was the dog of world government. Hibari, she's turning two this year. His eyes turned dull, exhibiting no emotion. Troops? I will first send the available force from Marineford. Retracting the rest from four blues will take some time. The call ended, and Sakazuki found himself huffing heavily. Raising his hand up, he wiped the sweat on his forehead. Huff, huff. What belief do you hold in regard to the Marines, justice? In Sakazuki's mind popped up the memory of the past. Back then, Sakazuki asked Smoker a question, trying to figure out what kind of Marine Smoker was. If I were to summarize my thought of justice in word. Arbitrary, I would say. Back then, Sakazuki simply snorted it off. Then, Smoker, after going through many things, revealed former Admiral Blaze's status as the chief of CP0, directly opposed the world government and broke free from chains that bound him. Greater, good. That was the word that Sakazuki often used to justify his actions. Upon muttering the word out, he couldn't help but chuckle. Greater good, for who? After all, he realized that his greater good only included the world government. Hibari. Nonetheless, Sakazuki stands up. Even after he finally learned that Marine no longer upholds the right justice, he couldn't stop, he's come far too much to turn back. Pressing a button, Sakazuki spoke. A you? A commander? How laughable. Standing proudly in front of one woman wearing goggles and headphones, Ginny, was Figureland Garling. Flicking the blood off of this white sword, Garling pointed its tip at Ginny and grinned. But in terms of look, you're quite appreciable. Now then, how about I take you as my slave instead? Never. Ginny growled, which Garling snorted at. I wasn't asking for your opinion, bug. Once I set my decision, it is how it is meant to be. Ginny looked around her surroundings. Most of the East Army were dead, and a few who remained alive were notably injured. She felt her heart dropping, but as the commander of the East Army, she couldn't afford to reveal any fear, no matter what kind of consequences she would end up facing. For years, we suffered. For years, you, the world government, controlled the world as you saw fit. And look where that led to, nothing but the cries and pleas of common folks. Ginny desperately shouted. You only care about yourselves. This world, this system, everything is built to benefit just you guys only. I refuse, we refuse this filthy world. 
As long as you continue to stand above us, we will continue to struggle, no matter how worthless it may seem, enough? Garling, whose veins were popping out of his forehead, ended Ginny's words. Taking in a deep breath, Garling lifted his hand to signal the army behind him that no action needed to be taken. Let's see if you can say the same after you lose an arm. Garling spoke coldly as he raised his sword and brought it down onto Ginny's exposed arm, before a huge, bare paw-like hand suddenly blasted Garling away from his spot, leaving Ginny without any harm. Huff, huff. Now, standing in front of Ginny was a huge man, one whom Ginny was extremely familiar with. Unable to conceal the tears of joy and relief, Ginny exclaimed, Kumachi! Are you, Huff, are you? Kuma, calming his breathing down, asked out of worry, Are you hurt, Ginny? Ginny, as tears freely flowed down her face, shook her head weakly. Angered, Kuma then gazed at the front where the troops of the world government warily pointed their weapons at Kuma. Simultaneously, the distant rubbles shook before Garling revealed himself from beneath. Frowning in a mix of embarrassment and rage, Garling growled. This humiliation. I won't tolerate it. TSK TSK, what champion of God Valley? A voice was then heard behind Garling. Garling turned back and angrily growled, shut your mouth, Lavender? There stood a wrinkly old woman who wore a huge cap that covered her eyes, Man Mayor Lavender, one of the God's Knights. She, while holding her rifle, crackled a laughter as she saw Garling's state. How about you return that title? A senile old man like you shouldn't be holding the glory, don't you think? So this is God's Knights? Upon hearing another voice interfering with them, Garling and the old woman named Lavender ceased their feud. Away from them, there stood one swordsman who inspected the scene impassively, Dracul Myhawk. You are? Myhawk, through his operation of hockey, was able to estimate their strengths. Quite disappointing, I must say. Myhawk felt like sighing, and therefore, he sighed. Dracul Myhawk. Don't assume that you plebeians stand above us simply because you were given the title of a warlord. Garling growled, before returning his attention to Kuma. Boom! As Kuma swung his hand, the explosive noise, and the troops of world government were blown away. Had cannon. The bare paw-like injuries appeared over the bodies of soldiers as they were blasted back. The remaining East Army watched in amazement, and Ginny seemed to have relaxed, feeling safe under Kuma's protection. Then, Garling reappeared in Kuma's sight, about to slash his sword down. Squish! Repelling the strike, Kuma successfully defended Garling's attack. Simultaneously, he placed his other hand at where Lavender stood, bang! Pad cannon! The bullet was instantly repelled, and without managing to hit Kuma, fell to the ground. Joy boy! Joy boy's heart! If this were to be true, no, it must be! The source of infinite energy! Lin Lin gulped. It will be the key to all the technologies that the ancient kingdom left. In other words, the owner of that heart, will be the owner of all those technologies. Truly the greatest treasure of the world. Lin Lin, while sweating all over, stood up wobbly. Calming herself down, she hurriedly moved out, too. I have two road poneglyphs, but so does Kaidu. And that damned Achiku, who knows how many he's managed to gather. She realized now that it was the Pirate Alliance who was the closest to One Piece. If she left them do as they wished, One Piece would go in their hands. After gaining an idea of what One Piece may be, Lin Lin could no longer stay still. A war, a war was needed, one that would allow her to step up and become the Pirate King. So Lin Lin walked to the Grand Hall, about to make a major announcement. However, once she arrived, she was the one to hear a news instead, Mama. Some assholes decided to invade our territory. Ha! Huh. Her eldest son, Perispero, then widened his eyes as he heard the rest from Den Den Mushi. In a shaky voice, he related to Lin Lin, Ayats, the Pirate Alliance. And? And? After that fight with the big bad dragon guy, what happened? Sitting by a big rock, Smoker stared at one child whose eyes were sparkled in wonder. I got flown all the way here. It was a peaceful island that Smoker stumbled upon, one that he didn't know existed, especially in New World of all places. By Smoker's side was a Den Den Mushi, one that he managed to borrow from the kind mayor of the village. Then what? Come on, don't keep me waiting, knowing that the situation was dire, Smoker simply ruffled the child's hair as he quickly dialed for a call. 
Though there was no white den den mushy to prevent eavesdropping, Smoker didn't have the luxury to care that much. The recipient of the call was none other than Maynard. Though it wasn't revealed before, Maynard was with Smoker in Dress Rosa during Smoker's clash with Kadu. Maynard was to monitor the situation and communicate with the civilians in Prudence, Meliana, and Vast Road should something go wrong. Smoker assumed that Kadu probably felt Maynard's presence, he let out a light sigh upon hearing Maynard. I was blown away from Dress Rosa. Is Kadu still there? So he isn't in Dress Rosa. Then, I suppose that he, hello, I'm Ola, a seven-year-old, and N, Smoker, pushing the kid's head away, continued speaking, Maynard. I'll be going to Wayno now. And you know which direction you're supposed to go to, Smoker fell silent, realizing that Maynard was right. How am I supposed to reach Wayno? Maynard's chuckle was heard, before he said, the entire island? Wahahaha, true. Ending the call, Smoker returned Den Den Mushy to the kid. Well, time for me to go. Make your parents proud, kid. Before the kid could speak, Smoker vanished into the thin air, leaving the kid shocked. Whoa! Holy smokes, Maynard. Up in the sky, there was a huge mass of dark smoke that floated by. Gray in color, it was evident that they were the indication that something, no, many things were burnt. Said dark smoke was connected to an island that stood in the middle of the sea. Without a doubt, it was Dress Rosa. Oi, Smoker! From the body of the water near Dress Rosa, Maynard waved his hand. Smoker chuckled dryly. And people call me crazy. Shaking his head, he flew down and caught Maynard by hand. Pulling up the bigger man and placing him on top of a floating smoke cloud that he generated underneath, Smoker commented, You look quite cooked. Haha, I suppose so. Maynard laughed heartily, feeling a bizarre sense of freedom that he never felt during his time in the Marine. Now that I managed to find my way back. Raising his hand at the smokes that covered Dress Rosa, Smoker concentrated. His hair flew wildly and his body glowed in gray. In correspondence, the huge volume of smoke that traveled upward began to swirl abnormally, before its color changed to that of white. Transmutation, white. They condensed and condensed before they were no longer able to resist the pressure and burst into a huge fit of water. Pouring down Dress Rosa, they collided with fire and generated steam, which Smoker caught onto and converted back into rain. Maynard watched, flabbergasted, as this process repeated over and over until the conflagration in Dress Rosa was completely subdued. Huff, huff, it's quite hard to get used to this. Smoker muttered as he finally lowered his hand and the glow on his body faded. Maynard, let's take some rest before we go. Why yeah, sure. Also, let's have a meal. I'm starving as hell. In Smoker's hand were a couple of fish. Maynard's eyes popped out in surprise, when did you even catch these? Anyway, what even is happening in the outside world? With fish bones scattered around, Maynard complained. It's been almost a month since we last read news, Smoker. As far as I remember, Revolutionary Army seemed to be readying to go to war against the world government, and Marines were failing to keep the rising surge of pirates contained. True. Smoker sighed lightly. But you know what? There's no point in thinking about things that are out of our control. Just focus on the matter that's in our hands right now, which is, yeah, yeah. Kadu, of how he ruins the lives of people and attained that gum gum fruit, which in secret was, uh, human human fruit, model, Nika. Standing up, Smoker flicked his finger. A small ball of white smoke was shot forth from said flick before it collided with the ground and generated a white smoke cloud. Get on and take out that eternal pose to Wayno. Smoker tapped his stomach and grinned in satisfaction, time to get back to work. I swear. Maynard mumbled in envy as he stepped on the cloud, whatever devil fruit appears in front of me, I'm going to eat it without any hesitation. Even if it's a useless fruit? Define useless. Fish fish fruit. How is that useless? Duh, Smoker smirked, can a fish breathe outside the water? No. But then, the devil fruit user is cursed by the sea. Oh. Maynard then laughed out loud, uncontrollably. Ha ha ha, what the fuck? So whoever ate fish fish fruit will never be able to use that ability, be it on the surface or in the water. Theoretically. Ha 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 ha. I'm pretty sure that Kadu's devil fruit is fish fish fruit though. Eh? 
Talking about trivial topics, the cloud flew out of Dressrosa at a rapid speed. Maynard, while expressing his impression of the speed at which they traveled, ensured that they were going in the right direction by repeatedly looking at the needle in the eternal pose to Wayno. Bang! Then, a noise of gunfire, along with the sudden bullet that went past Smoker's side, interrupted the piece. Ha! Maynard cried in annoyance and Smoker simply gazed down. Marines? Smoker squinted his eyes as a marine warship entered his eyes. Then, he raised his hand to catch a bullet with his fingers. No hockey. How are they able to shoot from this distance? Just how good must their eyes be for them to? Maynard, amid his speech, paused. He then muttered, Doll? Doll, you said? Smoker raised his eyebrow and Maynard nodded. I guess you don't know as much since you trained under Garpsan. In our group who received training from Zephyr Sensei, Doll was the best sharpshooter. I never knew her skill would get this good though. Shrugging, Smoker dropped the bullet that he was holding and casually flicked his hand, deflecting another bullet that came his way. Impassively, Smoker lowered the altitude at which they were traveling and directly approached the marine warship. The pace at which the bullets were being fired got faster, but Smoker, and even Maynard, weren't having a hard time dealing with them. After all, there was no hockey infused in those bullets. Heya, Smoker, Maynard. And as they finally got to see the faces on the ship, Smoker and Maynard found one short-haired woman, Dahl, waving her hands at them as she grinned. It's been a fucking four years since. How come you didn't even visit me once, huh? Thank you for such a warm welcome, Dahl. Smoker rolled his eyes as he made a sarcastic comment. But nonetheless, discarding his mask, Smoker grinned as he and Maynard landed on the ship. Still serving in G-14? Dahl held her fist out, to which Smoker casually met it with his. Heh, I'm the commander now. W. White Hunter Smoker? And Maynard who recently defected. V. Vice Admiral Dahl? Maynard looked around the marines who seemed confused and frightened by the sudden appearances of Smoker and Maynard. Anyway, what are you doing here even? Pretty sure this area isn't under G-14's charge. Well, Dahl then dropped a bomb. You see, Dr. Vegapunk disappeared from my area. And I find it highly likely that it was the doing of Kadu. What? Smoker and Maynard blinked, wondering if they heard it wrong. So? Maynard muttered, Kadu not only kidnapped, a uh, Tantata tribe from Dressrosa, but also kidnapped Dr. Vegapunk? Smoker added on, don't forget about him snatching gum gum fruit from world government's ship. What? Huh? Huh? And this time around, it was Dahl's time to be dumbfounded. Boom. Kekadu san you're back. Dropping from the sky, Kadu revealed himself from the cracks on the ground. With a deep frown on his face, he roared, assemble all the all-stars and Tobarapas. After his battle against Smoker paused, Kadu had some time to cool down his head. Regardless of whether his fight was enjoyable or not, it was for a fact that he lost high number of troops at the hands of Smoker. Smoker's hostility, as well as his vow to kill Kadu, remained as the truth. Kadu knew that this was just the beginning, even if he weren't to chase after Smoker's whereabouts, Smoker himself would come after him. One piece? Joy boy? After some time passed, Kadu was found to be seated on his throne-like seat that matched his gigantic size. In his palm was a purple devil fruit, gum gum fruit. Joy boy is the one who awakened the power of gum gum fruit, this means that if I can have one of my underlings become Joy Boy, won't this mean that I stand closest to One Piece? Talking to himself, Kadu grinned. And the one who will eat this fruit? Kadu placed the fruit back in a chest next to him, before calling one geisha who was playing Shamizen. You there? Why yes? Bring Yamato. You ah? Uh? When said geisha seemed troubled, one lean and tall man with thick makeup on his face made an entrance with a sly smile on him. You must be gentle with women you know, Kadu san turning to said man, Kadu grinned. Euchre. I hope that we are not late, Kadu Dano. One by one, Tobarapas entered. Amounting to five in total after Hibiki's death in Dressrosa, were now standing in front of Kadu with pirate-like vibes in them. And there, I went boom, bang. Then, that guy was like ouch, and, the muscular and bald man who has a scar on his closed right eye was iron armor, whist. He seemed to be talking endlessly about his past feats, one that others seemed annoyed to hear. Shut up for one second, whist. 
Roaring at whist was Weightless of Gongju, a short and scrawny man of old age, whose hands were supporting his hunched back. He, with three strands of hair remaining atop his bald head, currently his face red from his anger at whist. Oh ho ho, aren't you two a little bit too excited? The man of thick makeup, Euchre of the duality, laughed in a feminine manner. As Euchre said, we should calm down. We're here because Katadano called us, no? Another man with long black hair and samurai-like armor on him stated with his eyes closed and arms crossed. He was Thousand Blades Canasta. Finally, a sharp-looking green-haired man, taller than all the other Tobarapas, stood still with his hands in his pocket. He was Pinnacle the Predator. <laughs> Rubbing his chin, Canasta then pointed it out, are the Allstardanos not here yet? As the highest-ranked officers, they should be setting an example, ah, cut the crap with your samurai shit, Canasta. Then entered the gigantic man with obese body, Queen. He, while adjusting the sunglasses that he wore, snorted before stopping in front of Kadu. Mua. Just after, along with the strange noise, the room began to shake. Eventually, a man whose size was even greater than Kadu entered the room. He, whose eyes seemed to be staring at the thin air, was more obese than muscular, but somehow, was able to support his tremendous weight with his equally thick legs. Food. Tobarapas, upon facing the might of an all-star, fell silent. I don't like that guy. Snorting Queen turned his face the other way. This gigantic man was Jack the Famine, one whom no one would believe to be a human. So everyone is here, it seems. Kadu finally opened his mouth with a grin. Confused, Whist raised his hand, Air, King isn't here though? I mean, maybe he's dead, which would then make sense, since you called us, uh, so King died and we fight to decide who's going to be the next All-Star, and, shut up. Snarling, Gongju cut Whist's words. Kadu chuckled as he leaned his cheek onto his hand. He's already here. Queen snorted and Jack simply stared blankly. Behind Tobarapas, at the entrance to the room, there stood King, whose back was leaned to the wall. He, with mask still covering his facial appearance, spoke, I was here from the very start, weaklings. Now then. Kadu began speaking, I called you today for the preparation of a war, one that will rise very soon, here in Onigashima. A war. As Whist loudly exclaimed, Kadu's eyes narrowed, recalling his fight against Smoker. White Hunter, Smoker, he will soon arrive with his allies. Their goal is to free Wano and other countries from our grasp. King frowned as he remembered the feats that Smoker showcased in Dress Rosa. To proceed our plan of attaining one piece, traps, schemes, and whatever they may be, we must use all we have to kill them with minimal damage on our side. After all, after White Hunter comes the Pirate Alliance followed by Lin Lin. Kadu then looked at Queen and asked, Queen. How much have you proceeded with the Enhanced Warrior Project? Heh, I was waiting for you to say that. Queen rubbed his hands together as he smiled darkly. Though its completion will take some time, I've completed the prototype. By extracting the specific genetic information from Tantata tribe and inserting them into our members, they were able to attain a strength at least a tenfold of their original strength, just as how Tantatas have an extreme strength relative to their size. Ah, uh, Whist commented, yeah, I didn't understand a single thing of what you said. Food. Wurororo, perfect. Kadu grinned. How many enhanced gifters do we have so far? Around 30. Wurororo. Kadu seemed delighted by the news, laughing boisterously. Now then, the only thing that's left to do is to have Yamato eat this gum gum fruit, Kadu san Then entered one goon whose face was pale. Kadu's grin faltered and he raised an eyebrow, wondering what was wrong. P. Prince Yamato, H. He. What did Yamato do this time? He broke into the storage and ate a devil fruit. What? Kadu exploded in a rage. His body shook and his eyes gleamed in red, unable to remain calm after what he just heard. Nevertheless, he took in a deep breath. Breathing in and out a few times, he finally asked in a growl, which fruit did he eat? Ayats. The goon gulped. Dog dog fruit, model, Okucho no Mikami. And that day, the topmost room of Anagashima collapsed, again. Yamato? Just how close is Kadu to One Piece? After matching pieces of information, Maynard groaned as he massaged his temple. Damn. Dahl hummed, I didn't expect the situation to be this bad. 
I mean, the disappearance of Dr. Vegapunk is concerning by itself, but now. Watching as his two friends grimaced, Smoker let out a confident grin. What's the point of worrying? Isn't the solution to all those problems simple? Looking at the front, Smoker's eyes found the wild waterfall that crashing down from high above. Destroy Kadu and his beast pirates. That's all we need to do. So, do you have any plan? Eh? I mean, you came here, to Wayno, after speculating that Dr. Vegapunk is likely under Kadu's custody. That must have meant that you planned on infiltrating the island to rescue him, right? Um, right? Smoker, upon watching Dahl's antics, couldn't help but sweat drop. Since when have you become Maynard? Oi, Smoker! What do you mean by that? Maynard cried, and Dahl became wide-eyed as if hurt. How, how can you say that to me, Smoker? Huh? What's with that nuance, Dahl? Marines, watching from back, couldn't help but wonder if they were in reality. Why is it that Vice Admiral Dahl? Is that really White Hunter? Supposedly the man who killed millions of Marines for his ambition. Hey, don't tell me that you believe everything that the world government says. Quiet. Dahl then said in a charismatic voice, silencing all Marines in an instant. After, she pursed her lips as she answered Smoker. We investigated the area around this island for days, trying to find a way in. I did discover a hidden passage behind one part of the waterfall, but, it seemed that they were owned by beast pirates. I was looking for another possible way up until now, but that hidden passage was the only way we found so far. I see. Smoker grinned. Well then, it is fortunate that you met us here. Now, you see, looking up, Smoker gazed at the mist generated by the waterfall that covered the view. Our friends have already infiltrated Wayno. Friends? As in, Hina, Bastille, and, yep. Dahl expressed a surprise. I never expected to reunite with you folks here of all places. Me as well. Nodded Maynard. They probably disguised themselves after the infiltration. To contact them, make sure that you include the code within the speech. And that code is? Onajirai. What? Dahl deadpanned. In Wayno of all places, you use Onajirai as your code? Do you think we're that thoughtless? Smoker smirked knowingly. Onajirai technically has two meanings, rice ball and demon cutter. Depending on how you include it in your context, its meaning changes. Between these two meanings, which one fits more as the code? Oh damn. Dahl's jaw dropped in an impression. Maynard, from Smoker's back, nodded in pride. Well then, with everything having been said, Smoker finally returned his attention to the waterfall ahead of them. Get prepared to enter the island. How? Dahl questioned, to which Smoker turned his head and gave her a grin. Watch. White smoke began to pour out of Smoker, causing Marines nearby to shield their eyes in surprise. Bypassing them harmlessly, the smoke then wrapped around the bottom half of the warship, and began to lift it entirely, much to the shock of others. W.O., Marines gulped as they watched Smoker standing at his spot, unfazed. White Hunter, Smoker. Many said that if Smoker remained in the Marine, he without a doubt would have become an admiral. The stories of him have been mentioned many times in bars, and people always said during then, codenamed Shirohibi, White Snake. It was because he refused to remain as a snake that he was deemed a traitor. That devil fruit power of yours, insane as always. Dahl commented with a subtle amazement as they flew above the waterfall and past the thick mist. And finally, they got to see the bright sun shining down. Marines instinctively shielded their eyes as their eyes became accustomed to darkness. Eventually, the blinding light faded from their sight and everyone got to see, the huge land that stood ahead of the flowing body of water. Huge. Super huge. This. Maynard whispered, this is even larger than Dressrosa, by a lot. Large enough for us to evade Kadu's observation hockey. The ship landed on the water near the land. Said land ahead of them was a desolate wasteland that seemed to be devoid of life, to which some marines couldn't help but grimace, wondering what exactly happened here. What exactly happened here? Jumping out of the ship and placing his feet on the barren land, Smoker looked around with a frown on his face. Similarly, Maynard, Dahl, and the marines got off the ship and carefully checked the surroundings warily. It's hot in here. Wrinkling up his face as he raised his hand to cover the sunlight from reaching his face, 
Maynard then seemed to have noticed something. Wait, what's that? There was a trail of dust clouds afar. Dahl squinted her eyes before reporting what she saw, pirates, on top of horses, are chasing after people? Snorting, she held her hand out, and a marine soldier immediately came to hand her a huge sniper rifle. Supporting the entire weight of the firearm with her arms only, Dahl loaded and fired the gun in a split second. Bang! The trail of dust cloud ceased its movement. Then, the direction in which it traveled suddenly changed at where Smoker, Maynard, Dahl, and the Marines stood, which indicated that the pirates noticed them. Bang! 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 Done. Then, within a minute, Dahl plainly stated while handing the sniper rifle back to the Marine who was waiting by the side. They are still moving now? Horses. Dahl replied impassively. Maynard, who was trying his best to see what was happening afar, ended up shrugging. And just as Dahl said, the horses that were carrying the injured beast pirates appeared in Smoker's view. The horses, upon seeing Smoker and the rest, cried in fear as they hurriedly changed their direction. As they did so, Smoker simply operated his fruit ability to drag out the fallen pirates from the horses' backs. Thud. The horses ran away by themselves, and the groaning members of Beast Pirates were now on the ground in front of Smoker. Lowering his body, Smoker proceeded to slap the cheek of one pirate lightly. Hey! Ugh! Slap! Hey, can you hear me? Say something! Ah! The pirate's face was pale and his entire body was shaking. Weak ass! Maynard commented from the back with his arms crossed. Smoker sighed as he backed away. Interrogation isn't my type of thing. He then looked at Dahl. What happened to people who were being chased by these pirates? They successfully ran away into. Dahl pointed in a particular direction, before narrowing her eyes. Ha, huh, they're caught. There's more of these pirates? No, they aren't caught by pirates. Rather, they seem more like, bandits. As soon as Dahl said so, Smoker vanished from everyone's sight. What the, who, are you? Smoker was found getting the dust off of his hands. In front of him, three beaten thugs with swollen faces were found groaning as they gazed Smoker in fear. By the side, two people, a man and woman, looked at Smoker in a mix of curiosity and fear, wondering if he was their savior or yet another pursuer. Smoker didn't bother answering the question that came from one of the beaten thugs. Who I am is none of your concern. Rather, tell me, he crouched down and looked at one of the three thugs in the eye, who are you? You don't know who we are? Who are you? Then why did you attack us? Boom. Without any hesitation, Smoker slammed his fist down atop the head of the thug who screamed. With a bump on his head, said thug fell unconscious, much to the other two's shock. Smoker then proceeded to turn to another one. Who are you? The second thug gulped, having seen what would happen if he weren't to answer Smoker's question. W we, we are. After some time passed, Smoker was now looking at a map held in his hands. Let me get this clear. This region is, Kibi, of Wayno, and you are M.T. Adama thieves who serve a guy named Shutenmaru. Yes, why yes? Smoker turned to two civilians, on the other hand, you came from Amagasa village of Kuri, and were being chased after you tried to steal food from a place called Paradise Farm? Yes. The two civilians, the man and woman, were evidently malnourished. Smoker hummed in a thought. How many days have you starved? More than a week, sir. How many are in a similar situation as you? The man's eyes shook. Countless, sir. Smoker turned back to three beaten thugs as he folded and pocketed the map. Why did you even chase after these two? They don't have anything to offer. There are clothes to take, boom. Smoker slammed his hand atop the thug who answered. What a hopeless bunch. Smoker looked at the only thug who was conscious. The thug looked back at him and forced a shaky grin on his face, although his eyes contained fear. H he he he. Boom. As the last thug fell unconscious, Smoker saw Maynard appearing in front of him. Huff, huff, what did you even do? How the hell are you so fast when my Saru took this much to reach here, huh? While mumbling, Maynard noticed the scene around him. Three thugs were beaten and unconscious, while two civilians stood petrified, not knowing what to do. Someone didn't train enough while Zephyrsan was gone, that's for sure. Leaving a comment, Smoker dismissed Maynard's arrival and spoke to two civilians. Go back to your village and gather people. 
You're starving, aren't you? Huh? As the man widened his eyes, Smoker scratched his head. Paradise Farm. H.M. Collecting his thoughts, Smoker grinned. Staying low isn't my type of thing anyway. Maynard Sweat dropped behind Smoker, wondering what he was up to this time around. Bakura Town, Kuri, Wayno, Bakura Town is a town where only the essential tradesmen, those of high authorities, and beast pirates get to reside. It is located at the foot of the mountain where Kuri Castle used to be and is known for a great sumo wrestler tournament. Deep in Bakura Town, there is an area named Paradise Farm behind a large gate. This place is a large farm that rears all types of crops and animals, and exists as the sole source of clean supplies in Kuri. However, this place belongs to the current shogun of Ueno, Kurizumi Orochi, who uses the farm only for his sake. Hey, did you hear about that new geisha who's recently come? You know, the pink-haired one. Currently, deep in the night, the beast pirates laughed as they enjoyed mugs full of alcohol in their hands. Hannah, you mean? Heh, of course, she's been the main topic that everyone's been speaking for days. I heard that she's as beautiful as Kamurasaki. I wonder if that's true. As beast pirates drank and drank more, a man was seen passing by while advertising his item. Selling a fine bottle of sake, 20,000 belly for each. This man, characterized by blonde hair and sharp eyes, was none other than Rosinanti under disguise. Rosinanti was currently pushing a wooden cart where a couple of liquid-filled bottles, HM? Sake? Rosinanti's advertising seemed to have earned the attention of one pirate. The pirate, while grinning darkly, walked up to Rosinanti and picked up one bottle. Intently looking at the liquid inside, he questioned, and how do we trust you? W.A.? Taking a step back, Rosinanti said nervously, I, I received official approval from the Kayashiro family of Flower Capital. And how do we trust in your words? Pirates soon gathered around Rosinanti and began snatching the bottles. Let's see if you're telling the truth or not. Just in time, haha. I was craving for some sake. One after the other, they drank the sake brought by Rosinanti thoughtlessly. But little did they know, that Rosinanti was now staring at them coldly. Thud. Then, one by one, those pirates began to fall asleep and drop to the ground. After all, what was put in those sake bottles was a strong hypnotic. Watching as the last pirate fell asleep, Rosinanti took a step forward toward the direction in which the Paradise Farm lied. Just then, boom. The entire gate of Paradise Farm was blown out before a smoke-made cart full of food was flown out of it abruptly. Eh? Completely shocked, Rosinanti exclaimed with his eyes popping out, Es Smoker-san? Huh? Hearing Rosinanti, Smoker, who stood atop the smoke-made cart along with Maynard and Dahl, raised an eyebrow. Then, he grinned as he found Rosinanti, Hey, Rosinate. It's been a while. Rosinanti was left speechless by Smoker's casualty. During the night, many regions of Wayno were left awake. What is happening? The starving civilians looked up at the sky. Then, their eyes widened in disbelief. The food, was raining down the sky. Huh? At the top, there was a huge silhouette that flew through the dark sky. Wondering if a miracle was happening, people hurriedly grabbed the raining food and filled their stomachs. Oh Oroki-sama! In flower capital, there sat a large man with a big head and stocky build. He, possessing dark purple hair and a thin mustache of the same color, had a blush on his cheeks as he poured alcohol from a bottle in his hand onto an exquisite-looking liquor cup. Kurizumi Orochi. He was the shogun of Ueno, one who was allied to Kaidu of the Beast. And currently, he was found frowning, clearly irked by the fact that his time was interrupted. After all, on his left and right were two beautiful geishas who were playing fine music. The first thing to note about the geisha on the left was that she was green-haired. Though it was impossible to tell how she looked due to how she wore a kitsune mask over her face, the beauty itself seemed to emanate out of her. Kamurasaki, that was the name that she went with. Though her age was yet young, she had already acquired the title of Oiren, the highest of all geishas. On the other hand, the pink-haired geisha on the right was the rising star of Ueno, Hana. She began her career as a geisha just a week ago, but her beauty, unparalleled by any other, was enough to shake the hearts of all men in Wayno. The fragrance of flowers entered the messenger's nose as he rushed into the room. He blushed while taking an unconscious step back, but shook his head to return his senses to the utmost matter at hand. 
What? Orochi growled, and his eyes seemed to be promising pain if the reason for interrupting his time wasn't sufficient enough. Haven't I told you not to interrupt me? Biba, you have to see this. The messenger cried. Pea Paradise Farm has been raided. And the food, the culprits are spreading food everywhere. What? Orochi paused, wondering if he heard it wrong. And from the back, Hannah silently eyed the messenger. Say that again. Paradise, the blood abruptly spilled as at the next moment, a knife struck Orochi's neck. Orochi fell. Kamurasaki's music stopped. The messenger was rendered confused at first, before his eyes widened in shock. Right next to the fallen body of Orochi was Hana, whose eyes exhibited the coldness, the quality of a warrior. Don't bother, Kurizumi Orochi. Orochi's body twitched as he made a gurgling noise. The blade of that knife is sea stone carved. You can't use your ability. From her back, Kamurasaki looked at Hana in disbelief. Hana grabbed her kimono and threw it aside, revealing a casual outfit. Snorting, she reached into her pocket and took out the black gloves, ones which she slowly put on her hands. Hina tired. Raising her foot, Hana, no, Hina stomped Orochi on his face, crushing it mercilessly. Why you? The messenger stuttered before he hurriedly turned back, trying to run away. However, before he could do so, Hina was already right in front of him. Hina kicked the messenger, and bizarrely, her leg phased through the man. By the time she retracted her leg, there was a metal bind that tied the man's arms and torso together. From the force, the messenger lost his balance and fell to the ground. The bound messenger couldn't help but whisper shakily, Ha Hannah, why are you doing this? Hina is Hina, not Hannah. Hina slicked her hair back and enjoyed a sense of freedom. Smoker arrived and Hina got all the information Hina needed. This means that there is no reason for Hina to act any longer. Hina opened the door and walked to the terrace. Looking at the sky where the food was raining down, Hina outstretched her arm to grab one that was thrown at her. It was a simple ball of rice that had a seaweed wrapped around it. On a gyri. On the roof right above, Smoker was found sitting. Really, Smoker. Taking a bite out of the rice ball, Hina smirked. Who knew you'd become a geisha of all roles? That was the best option Hina had. Is it? Smoker grinned. Then as geisha, what information did you get? Hina returned with a confident smile of her own. Turned to face Kamurasaki, Hina informed, first of all, that girl's true name is Kazuki Hayori. Kazuki, as in, Kazuki Odin, Kazuki? Yes. That's when Kamurasaki or Hayori found herself shocked for the second time, though her expression was hidden behind her mask. W wait. How, boom. Orokisama. The door into the room was bashed open, and a very tall man with slanted eyes and blue hair entered. Upon the entry, he immediately noticed the bound messenger and dead Orochi, and froze, trying to process the scene in front of him. Then, he raised his head to look at the terrace connected to the room, where Smoker and Hina were found. Hi? Smoker waved his hand awkwardly, and Hina simply looked at the man plainly. In another region of Wano named Udon, there exists a prisoner mine where the rebels who fought against Orochi and beast pirates were worked and tortured relentlessly. This place was under the rule of Queen of Beast Pirates, but Queen, having been busy with new experiments recently, was currently absent. Deep in the night, the beast pirates who guarded the area seemed tired, for they jolted off as they continued the watch. And to this prisoner mine, three figures brazenly invaded. They were Bastille, Senor Pink, and X Drake, who had been acting as mountain bandits. Dara Dara Dara. Laughing loudly, Bastille swung his huge sword, Zanbato, horizontally. The guards were caught off guard before they were slashed. Ah? Bandits. It's those bandits. Quick, grab your weapons. Onto one screaming pirate, X Drake slammed his axe. The blood splashed onto his face, but he seemed unfazed by it. Simply wiping it with his hand, X Drake hacked his axe at another pirate. This reminds me of my old days. Senor Pink exclaimed as he mashed the heads of two pirates together. Letting go of those heads, he then jumped up to dodge a bullet shot at him and landed a punch straight at the shooter's face. It's only three, you know. Why are you guys falling? One by one, pirates went down without putting up sufficient resistance, especially since there were only goons in the prisoner mine currently. Heh, piece of cake Dara. 
Bastille grinned as his Zanbato slashed through tens of enemies at once. Razanandi just called and told us that Smoker has arrived, and this means that we no longer need to hold back. Boom. In the end, all members of the beast pirates in the prisoner mine fell, either dead or unconscious. Bastille slammed his Zanbato on the ground and placed his hands on his waist. TCH. X Drake grumbled, they aren't even worth a warm up. I agree, kiddo. Senor Pink adjusted the sunglasses that he was wearing, even though it was midnight. Then, he reached into his pocket, took out a ring full of keys, and threw it to Bastille who caught it. Bastille stepped up with the grin still on his face. Reaching the cells, he looked around at the prisoners who were looking at the trio with surprise. Everyone, listen Dara. I'm Bastille, this brooding teenager is X Drake, and this sunglasses weirdo is Senor Pink Dara. None of the prisoners responded. Their eyes seemed to be holding curiosity and amusement as if watching comedians. Tonight, we are going to destroy beast pirates, and I ask you that you join us in our endeavors Dara. What? Ha 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 ha! All prisoners burst into laughter, unable to conceal it any longer after hearing what Bastille said. Are you crazy? One of the prisoners, one who looked like a veteran samurai, then spoke up. Destroy beast pirates? You speak as if it's possible to kill Kadu. Kadu, ha, huh, no one can defeat that monster. Another then snorted. All of us tried. However, no matter how many times we hit him, not even a scar remained. In the end, even that Odin-sama fell short against Kadu, what if we can? X Drake interrupted the man. With conviction, he said, Beast pirates may have Kadu, but we have Smoker. Smoker? Who's that? One man mumbled. A guy who smokes. Ha 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 ha. Urgh. X Drake stomped his foot in frustration. Have you never heard of the moniker, White Hunter? White Hunter. Hunter of white? Kadu isn't white in any way though. Ha 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 ha. Growing a tick mark on his forehead, Senor Pink spoke up this time around, so you're just gonna stay here and act blind? True men, regardless of the situation, don't give up. Says the guy who wears sunglasses during the night. Ha 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 ha. Oi. Senor Pink growled as he pointed at one man in particular, I'm not the only one, fuckards. Everyone turned at the man whom Senor Pink pointed at and fell silent. Oh shit. This man had long cyan hair and similar colored goatee. His body was notably larger than most of the prisoners, and he, with his arms crossed, seemed displeased. Oyabun. We didn't mean that just now, whatever. Sighing, this man looked at Bastille in seriousness. So, white hunter or smoker of whatever he may be, you claim that he is strong enough to kill Kadu? For sure. Bastille nodded without hesitation, and the man sighed once more. It isn't that we are afraid of death, youngsters. If our deaths were enough to achieve freedom from those accursed pirates, we would gladly give our lives. However, words alone carry no strength. So you're going to rot in here forever? Hold up. Pausing, the man entered a deep thought. If we are forever tortured in here and die, won't that be more worthless? Then, even if these young men aren't speaking the truth, if we get another try at killing Kadu. Let's go! Oyabun! Huh? It didn't take long for the man to conclude. I'm Hayagoro of the Flower, the former Yakuza boss of the Flower Capital. Even if this were to be meaningless in the end, I will give my aid to you. Bastille, Senor Pink, and X Drake found their eyes twitching. Deep in the night, the street of Flower Capital is surprisingly noisy and bustling. However, unlike the usual oppressiveness, there existed a sense of freedom. For years, they starved. For years, they were ruled by a monster who joined hands with a catastrophe of all things. Even the smallest miracle wasn't seen, and they continued living throughout the days because they couldn't afford to die. Then, the food rained down in the sky. Everyone instinctively felt that something, perhaps a miracle, was happening. How big are the beast pirates? Roughly a 20,000. Their noteworthy members? King the Conflagration, Queen the Plague, and Jack the Famine. In addition, five members who hold the title of Toborapo. And on this night, a white-haired man, smoker, and pink-haired woman, Hina, were talking on the terrace of Orochi Castle. What about the whereabouts of gum gum fruit? Orochi never mentioned it, so I'd assume that Kadu kept it secret. 
I did hear elsewhere that Kaidu recently placed a chest next to his throne in Onigashima. Hey! Waking himself up from trance, Kayashiro drew his sword and shouted at Smoker and Hina. However, Smoker and Hina simply ignored Kayashiro as if he posed no threat to them. I see. Instead, Smoker momentarily entered a deep thought to digest the information that Hina shared. He seemed not to care for the fact that Hayori was staring at them from the back, left speechless. Smoker then spoke. Have you heard anything about Dr. Vegapunk? Hey! What? Why would he come out all of a sudden? Hina raised an eyebrow. There is a high chance that he's here in Wano, caught by beast pirates. Huh? That's what Dahl said. She's also here, right now, with her marines. What's the chance of her backstabbing us? Smoker blinked upon hearing Hina's question. Cautious, aren't you? We haven't seen her for years. Of course I would. Hina humphed while crossing her arms. Smoker shrugged. Essentially zero, says my observation hockey. That should be enough then. Anything else you got to share? Hey! Right. There's a rumor about Kaidu's son, who's turning 14 this year. It's hard to estimate his accurate strength, and we should be cautious. Smoker and Hina casually conversed as if they were alone by themselves. From the back, Kayashiro's arms which held his sword dropped, dumbfounded. Who the hell are they even? Hina then perked up and looked at Kayashiro. Additionally, that guy is Kayashiro, the head of the Yakuza organization named Kayashiro Family. They are hired bodyguards of Kurizumi Orochi, the big-headed corpse over there. During the night, he disguises himself, robs the wealthy people, and distributes the stolen goods to the poor residents of Ebisu town of Flower Capital. For that, he earned the moniker Ashimitsu Kozo. Wait, what, Kayashiro's eyes widened, before he reached his hand out, trying to stop Hina from speaking. However, his attempt was ignored as Hina continued, he's also the one who secretly took care of Kazuki Hayori over there. I'd assume that he's some kind of spy whose true allegiance falls to the Kazuki family. Kayashiro fell silent. Then, his eyes sharpened as his grip on his sword tightened. You know far too much. He dashed at Smoker and Hina with a grim thought, you must die here, only for his sword to be stopped by Smoker's finger. Eh? Oh, you're pretty strong. Smoker commented as Kayashiro stared at him with a snot dropping out of his nose. Then, he flicked his finger, which caused Kayashiro's blade to be knocked back. You see, Smoker, looking at Kayashiro and equally dumbfounded Hayori, spoke to them. We're here for one simple goal, to destroy beast pirates. Looking around, Smoker saw that the messenger whom Hina previously tied up with a metal ring was silently wriggling his way out of the room. But it seems that beast pirates aren't the only ones. Although that Orochi guy is dead, there still are his gangs who act in their self-interest. Therefore, we need someone to take care of the situation here. Walking up to Kayashiro, Smoker tapped the man on the shoulder. We'll leave that to you. Kayashiro didn't respond but stood petrified, unable to understand what Smoker, the stranger whom he met just a few minutes ago, was saying to him. Hayori, wondering if she was dreaming, slapped herself on the cheek, but her view didn't change. Then, in the next blink of an eye, Smoker and Hina were gone from the scene. Food! How, how is this possible? In the middle of Amagasa village, people surrounded a pile of food that they dreamed of having. They, in a state of famine, seemed tired just trying to stay awake during the night. However, on their faces were smiles. Marines neglected their duties for years. Because they were nothing but pets of the world government who valued balance of the world, the pirates of the new world were left free to do whatever they wished to do. And look what that led to. Smoker, watching as people got their hands on food and fed their children, chuckled dryly. Someone has to do it. If no one's willing to do so, I will. Smoker recalled his last clash against Kaidu just a day ago. It was only a brief fight, but he felt it, and Kaidu probably did as well. We're on par with one another. Thus, the dictating factor of the battle between the two of them will be creativity, of how well one uses his fruit ability. Silently, Smoker turned away from civilians and faced those who were waiting at his back, his friends. Iron Armor, Whist. Weightless Gongju. Euchre of the Duality. Thousand Blades Canasta. Pinnacle the Predator. Jack the Famine. Queen the Plague. King the Conflagration. 
From what we confirmed, all of them are users of Zoan-type devil fruits. Among them, Robin who held a flashlight and a book, calmly stated. Among them, King the Conflagration is the most dangerous. It was said that he, as the number two of the crew, was with Kaidu since the establishment of Beast Pirates. Then, Queen the Plague. He was a part of MADS which was led by Dr. Vegapunk until its closure. Apart from his strength, the versatility of his ability is something to be cautious of. Flipping to the next page, Robin continued to detail the information she wrote down in the book. Then comes Jack the Famine. Though human, he seems to lack an adequate level of intellectual ability. In return, however, he has a devastating physique that would put most people under shame. King, Queen, and Jack altogether are known as Kadu's All-Stars, the Triforce of Beast Pirates. By the side, Aramaki was found grinning with a hand below his chin, as if excited by the idea of fighting. In correspondence, members of matching strength should be dispatched to fight those three. After an astute judgment, we concluded, Robin looked at the book, Bastille for Jack, before turning to look at Hina, who cracked her knuckles covered by black gloves. Hina for Queen, then Aramaki, who stood up and rolled his shoulders. Aramaki for King. Closing the book, Robin looked at the others around. The rest of us will handle Tobarapas as well as the rest of Beast Pirates. Shinuchis, who fall under the rank below Tobarapo, may serve as anomalies. Furthermore, the number of beast pirates amounts to approximately 10,000 strong. On the other hand, we, after including the marines under Dahl's command and the prisoners whom Bastille reported to have freed in Udon, amount to around 100 in total. This means that if one person falls, everyone will go down like a domino. Failure isn't an option. Finally, Robin turned to Smoker. Nevertheless, leave everything else to us. After all, you have one important task, one that only you can achieve. Smoker smiled knowingly. Destroy Kadu. Rahahaha. Heh. Hina waiting. The marines who stood behind shivered, unable to believe how Smoker and his friend seemed to be certain of their victory. If it's them, the ones whom I knew for years. Dahl smiled with a cold sweat on her. In her, the memories from the past were being replayed. This won't be impossible. Let's go. Smoker, with his smile dead and nothing but seriousness on him, stated. Onto Udon it is. Up in the sky, the moon was hidden by the cloud, as if aware of the war that was about to break any time. Everything happened in one day. Once that the people of Wayno weren't able to achieve for the past six years, Smoker achieved right after his arrival. Wurororo. Kadu grinned as he sat on his throne, with his cheek leaning into his hand. And so, you've arrived, White Hunter. Then, his grin abruptly died down. His eyes flashed in crimson, conveying nothing but bloodthirst. Kadu stood up from his seat and began walking. Boom. Boom. Every one of his steps caused a slight shake. He was the very definition of catastrophe, the disaster that brings civilizations into destruction. You and I, we have a lot on our shoulders, don't we? Kadu whispered to himself. Though the fight before was enjoyable, it no longer is the time for me to enjoy. After all, beyond this war, there exists, the secrets of Joy Boy and One Piece itself. Grimly, Kadu ordered, gather all the available troops. Set ships afloat. Tonight, we will show those pseudo-marines, of what it means to defy the future pirate king. Heeding to Kadu's order, numerous ships that amount to more than 50 sailed out from Onigashima onto the body of water that separated the island from Wano. Kadu himself, now present on the flagship that was thrice the size of other ships, glared ahead. Behind him stood the three all-stars, Fuud. Jack the Famine, damn those people. Why did they have to come while I was in the middle of my research? Queen the Plague, don't fool around. White Hunter isn't a man whom you can treat lightly. In some sense, this battle, may be the hardest one we've had yet. And King the Conflagration. The sea churned, and waves rose. The cloud above swirled and gusts blew wildly. Then, finally came in sight, three moderate-sized wooden ships that were sailing toward the numerous ships of beast pirates. Paz! The lightning crashed down on the water. The sways of ships intensified, but Kadu didn't care. Instead, his eyes were locked on ahead. On the other side was Smoker, who met Kadu's intense gaze with his own. Unlike last time, there was no excitement of battle, and both of them knew that there wouldn't be one. 
The cheering noises on Beast Pirate's ships died down as their enemies entered the site. Smokers Group 2 readied themselves as they felt their hearts thumping. Bizarrely, the wild waves began to die down. The continuous strikes of lightning from the sky ceased. Everything, be it the living beings or the nature, fell silent. Then, Smoker and Kadu's hockey spiked simultaneously, before everyone felt the overwhelming Conqueror's hockey springing forth from them. They clashed. The water erupted, storms appeared, and lightning rained down at a more frequent pace. All people, be it the pirates, marines, pseudomarines, or Wano inhabitants, shielded their faces, unable to withstand the intensity of the clash between two supreme kings. After what seemed to be an everlasting amount of time had passed, the conqueror's hockeys died down in a stalemate. Many sighed in relief as they released the breath that they were unconsciously holding in. In this state, Smoker and Kadu simultaneously jumped from their respective ships. As he clenched his hand into a fist, Smoker's fist revealed a dangerous-looking black lightning, the infusion of Conqueror's hockey. Similarly, the Kanabo under Kadu's tight grip crackled in the black lightning. Without any warning, the fist and Kanabo crashed into each other, although there was a gap between them as if they were being repelled. A huge booming noise resounded across the sky before the black spark spread everywhere in the sky. The very air itself screeched and shook from the clash. The swirling cloud above was split into two, revealing the bright moon beyond. And this was the sign. It was as if they were in a separate world, clashing in the sky with forces unlike any other. The rain filled the sky as the pressure inflicted by two powerhouses reached the dense cloud. The booming noises continued to resound throughout the zone and black lightning crackled in a fashion that made it seem as if the sky itself was quaking from the impact. Ha! Hayagoro, as he watched such a scene from one ship below, couldn't help but mumble in disbelief. A young man like him, going on par with Kadu? He found a grin creeping up on his face as he lowered his gaze to the front, to where the numerous ships of beast pirates stood. Boys! Therefore, Hayagoro laughed. The time has finally come. Be it us or them, tonight, through death, we'll finally be freed from the tortures we've been enduring. He unsheathed his katana and pointed it at the beast pirates. Charge! Yakuza's had their eyes filled with determination as they fearlessly glared at the overwhelming number of ships ahead. On another allied ship by the side, Dahl was giving orders to her soldiers. Your task is to ensure that these three ships under our possession don't sink. Identify the incoming explosives and deal with them accordingly. Our number far pales in comparison to them, but remember who you are. You stand here today to showcase that justice prevails. Instead of fear, have pride in your heart. Turning around, Dahl's eyes sharpened. And here we go. Just as she said, they witnessed the sparks of cannons that briefly illuminated the darkness. The sky was then filled with numerous cannonballs, heading right at them. Seems like it's my time to shine Dara. Grinning, one huge figure jumped to the sky, Bastille. He, revealing his huge Zanbato, held it tight with two hands as he coated its blade with armament hockey, emission. Then, he swung the blade horizontally. Shockingly, an arc of armament hockey spread out upon the swing and struck numerous cannons one by one, B-O-O-M. The cannon simultaneously exploded up in the sky, and due to the intensity of the light, many momentarily closed their eyes. And as the light momentarily brought the blindness to the area, Aramaki, Hina, Bastille, X Drake, Senor Pink, Rosinanti, and Maynard, as if they've been waiting for this, used this opportunity to dash at the enemy ships through the use of Jeppo. Silent. Shrouded by Rosinanti's fruit ability to mute all sounds that one produces, each one of them landed in the middle of beast pirates whose eyes were closed. By the time the beast pirates realized, a disastrous situation was already ongoing. The vine suddenly rose out of nowhere and wrapped around the entire ship. Catching every single pirate present on the ship, those plants then proceeded to suck moisture out of them. On another ship, the series of black metal bars expanded from the middle. Crushing all that it bulldozed through, the network of metal bars shredded said ship into pieces and caused all pirates within to fall into the water. And that wasn't the end. W what is, Bastille, right above the third ship of Beast Pirates, swung his Zanbato down, cleaving the ship into two. Beast Pirates on adjacent ships yelped in horror, with their attention focused on Aramaki, Hina, 
and Bastille who effortlessly destroyed huge ships as if it was as easy as a simple stroll around a town, such that they didn't notice the other four members sitting under their nose. The blood splattered as Rosinanti's hand impaled a pirate's neck. Retracting it back with cold eyes, Rosinanti moved at a blinding speed, violently ripping pirates apart with his hockey-coated hands, which were now drenched in blood. Grah! Forcing his rage out, one of the remaining pirates swung his weapon at Rosinanti, albeit with his body trembling. Rosinanti didn't bother dodging the incoming blade. Turning his body around and stepping closer to said pirate, the blade came in contact with Rosinanti's shoulder and shattered into pieces without dealing any harm. As the pirate revealed his stupefaction, Rosinanti's hand drilled its way into his chest, instantly ending his life. Let's see. Rosinanti looked around and saw X Drake circularly swinging his axe. Looking the other way, he saw Senor Pink and Maynard finishing their endeavors in other ships of beast pirates. Seeing how their sneak attack had become successful, Rosinanti snapped his fingers. Ha! Huh. Correspondingly, all sounds were returned to members, as X Drake released a war cry. Boom! Rahahaha! Aramaki laughed as he lifted one entire ship with hundreds of vines and slammed on another. The pieces of ships and pirates flew in every direction, which caused Robin, who remained at one of the three ships under the Allies' possession, to sweat drop. Who's the villain here? Just as she muttered to herself, seven ships of beast pirates were found approaching them from left and right, having circumvented the ongoing ruckus by Aramaki and others ahead. It's only three ships! One among the beast pirates shouted, which Robin assumed to be a Shinuchi. Attack! As if we'd let you! Hayagoro roared as he, with his other Yakuza members, jumped onto the closest ship of beast pirates. They clashed blade to blade and said ship sway due to the sudden increase in the number of people on top of it. Bang! And right onto the forehead of the man whom Robin assumed to be a Shinuchi, Dahl's bullet struck. The man's life has met its end before he registered it, and Dahl, without any moment of celebration, firmly ordered, 11 o'clock, two ships are approaching. Ready yourselves and fire upon my order. The pirates were now near to an extent where the marines could see their psychotic grins. Fire. Upon Dahl's order, the marines began the firing spree. Many pirates fell from the strike, but one standing behind continued their advancement without any fear. After all, death and combat were their lives. Crazed in bloodlust, they jumped off of their ship, about to land on the ship that marines and Dahl occupied. Trying to flur. However, they didn't expect multiple hands to grow out of their backs at the next moment. Sure gone. The airborne pirates lost their momentum and fell into the ocean with vivid holes in their necks. Blinking her eyes, Dahl turned to Robin and saw that the latter had her arms raised and crossed to form an X-like shape. Not bothered by Dahl's gaze, Robin assessed the situation. Multiple ships of beast pirates were now damaged or in the process of sinking. None of their allies seemed in a fatal state so far. Great, Robin's thought paused as she saw a pteranodon, which had its entire body set aflame, flying high above the sky. That's. Said pteranodon then dropped right on top of Aramaki and the plants he produced. There was a huge explosion that knocked the nearby ones off their feet, and watching the scene from afar, Robin grimaced. Here they come. Through a megaphone, Queen's high-pitched voice boomed loudly. That was enough information collected from our side. Forest forest fruit, Cage cage fruit, com com fruit, and flower flower fruit. Others aren't fruit users, and though their strengths are stronger, not only are our executives able to match them, but we are far superior in number. Whispering to himself, Queen chuckled shrewdly. Just as Queen spoke, five executive members of Beast Pirates, the Tobarapas, jumped up and revealed themselves. Tap. You got no idea for how long I've been waiting for this. Though I was first annoyed by how I was woken up two hours ago, I was quickly delighted by the fact that. Whist, the man who talked non-stop, landed in front of X Drake who raised his caution with an awareness that the man in front of him was much tougher to deal with. Peking Duck. Gong Zhu's dropped right onto Senor Pink with his right foot extended, which Senor Pink countered with his own punch. Oi, is this for real? Senor Pink snorted as his eyes focused on Gong Zhu through his sunglasses. I'm not a fan of beating up an old man who's a step away from entering a coffin. Oomph. Simply snorting back, Gong Zhu backflipped and landed across Senor Pink. Then, 
Getting into a kung fu stance, Gong Zhu launched himself at Senor Pink. Clang! Maynard hurriedly raised his blade to parry an incoming slash. The man who suddenly appeared, Canasta, expressed admiration at that, a good reaction speed you have there. TCH! Clang clang clang! They exchanged fast series of sword fighting. Their clashes generated sparks and cuts all around the ship that the two of them stood on top of. Others watched in awe as their swords accelerated more and more. Clang! Now now, why don't you calm down for a moment? Dahl frowned as Euchre, suddenly sitting on a chair behind her, voiced himself. Euchre then tilted his head as he shifted his eyes to where Robin stood. Robin clicked her tongue, seeing that her fruit ability didn't manage to reach the man. Truthfully speaking, I don't enjoy the fights. Casually yet dramatically, Euchre sighed. However, it seems that fighting is inevitable, this is war, after all. Then, suddenly, his demeanor shifted completely, as if he was possessed by a demon, so let's fight. Dahl was caught off guard as the man suddenly transformed into a gigantic alligator with ferocious fangs, ready to bite Dahl. Dahl quickly backpedaled and the gigantic alligator's fangs missed her, biting the empty air. And finally, the last of Toberopus, Pinnacle, landed on the ship painted with blood. Rosinanti, with his hands completely red from enemy's blood, viewed Pinnacle in caution. Similarly, Pinnacle, whose height far surpassed Rosinanti's, looked down on Rosinanti with hands in his pockets, unfazed by the sheer number of corpses that were laid on the ship. In silence, they stared at each other, before their forms blurred at the same time. Boom! The hand-to-hand -hand combat then initiated, with the goons of beast pirates who witnessed the fight being unable to follow with their eyes. H.M. Hayagoro, who was slaying beast pirates around him with his hockey-coated sword, then widened his eyes as he was hit by a punch of sufficient force. Knocked to the side, he quickly rose back up and looked at the one who assaulted him. There was a man whose nose was long and sharp in a bizarre manner. As he grinned, Hayagoro couldn't help but whisper in realization, Tantata tribe? Boom! Yakuza's began to face resistance as the pirates with strengths that were greater than others by many folds appeared one by one. They, whose facial characteristics resembled the Tantata tribe, a group of small-sized dwarves, possessed an innate strength and resistant skin that metals couldn't penetrate through. In addition, there were a swarming number of beast pirates to take care of. Hayagoro, while shedding a cold sweat, forced a smile. This won't be an easy one, I see. As Yakuza's were occupied with such, Hina and Bastille stood side to side, inspecting the countless number of enemies that were at the back, not yet engaging themselves in a fight. The number is quite troubling. Hina mumbled, and Bastille grinned. Dara Dara, and that's what makes it more fun. In their sight entered Queen, who dropped the megaphone in his hand, and an even more big and obese fellow, Jack, who was aside from the man, eating. Let's go! Upon Hina's call, the two of them dashed at the awaiting all-stars. Having expected this, Queen grinned as he revealed his metallic arm. Food. Jack. Queen pointed at Bastille who was approaching Jack, kill that guy, and you'll get all the food you want. Reya alalalui. Mohahaha. Yes. Jack's eyes suddenly turned red as he suddenly blasted himself off the ship, causing the deck he stood on top of to break into pieces. Seeing that Jack was now above him, Bastille changed his direction and flew upward through the use of Jeppo. This is what you wanted, right? Queen, now clashing his hockey-coated left arm against Hina, laughed. Muhahaha, you better thank me for my courtesy, through your death, that is. Hina doesn't lose to a fat man. Fat? Ha! Huh. These are muscles that simply went through the aging process. Do you know how attractive I used to be? Retracting her arm, Hina retreated a few steps and stood around the pirates who now surrounded her along with the queen. Opening her right palm, Hina generated a pair of metal tonfa which she held in her hands. Up high in the sky, Smoker's smoke-shrouded fist met Kadu's kanabo once more. Surrounded by the bright light of the moon and lingering clouds, they were so high up that it was impossible to view the situation that was progressing below. However, the war below no longer mattered to them for they instinctively knew that the victor of this fight between the two of them, would dictate the victors of the war. White Hunter! Kadu smashed his dangerously crackling Kanabo forth, which Smoker met with an equally dangerous fist. The black lightning sparked before the sonic boom occurred, 
causing the two of them to be blasted in the opposite direction from the recoil. It was truly the battle among the world's finest warriors. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.